Hello and welcome to the Transfers Podcast, powered by footballtransfers.com, a new podcast where we bring you news, insight and analysis on that most important of the least important things, football. I'm Ronan Murphy, I'm back again, you'll be glad to hear, and I'm joined this week, as always, by Duncan Castles. How are you, Duncan? I'm very good, Ronan, I've been enjoying uh, watching you winding up Pep Guardiola and Neil Lennon, among others, this week on Twitter. Yeah, that is that is my 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 goal in life, is to wind up as many people as possible, as many football fans as possible, and get accused of supporting rival clubs to every other football club. <laughs> yeah. You're clearly a Man United fan because you've criticised Liverpool this week. And then next week it'll be, you're clearly a Liverpool fan because you've criticised Man United. So if you if you just criticise everybody equally, then it, I don't think you can be accused of any sort of inherent bias. No, you just get accused of hating football and hating us on a, on a regular basis. But these are these are the joys of, of, uh, of covering football as a profession. We shouldn't complain about stuff like that. We get... Uh, we get to do lots of fun stuff or, or off the back of it. Yeah, we yeah we do. My tone in, in life is just to uh, be a snarky Irishman, sarcastic <laughs> Irishman. But I really enjoy football and I do watch far too much football. So looking forward, we're getting we're actually getting very close to competitive men's club football being back. So you know, the major leagues, the League of Ireland never went away. Major leagues in, in Europe are, are coming back and that's what our listeners are here for. They don't want to hear me talk about League of Ireland again on this show. I think they've had enough League of Ireland chat for, for any one podcast. But in the meantime, we'll talk about some transfers. And this week, we're, we're going to talk Manchester United, a bit of Arsenal, a bit of Newcastle. And then the, whether there's been a downturn in, in spending and there hasn't really been 100 million signings like we saw last summer, or huge moves. So is the transfer market going to kick into gear as the these last few weeks come before the the competitive football does return. So I suppose as we often do, we'll get started with Manchester United and obviously I mean they're still looking for midfielder. They've signed their their centre back, their their forward, but midfield has been long been an issue for Manchester United and they still haven't solved it. So you have an update for me on that. Yeah, signed signed one centre back who's who's already injured, which is something we'll we'll talk about a little bit later in, in the podcast. Um, and uh, Zerksy, the the forward to work aside, alongside Hoyland, also injured in, in pre season. And, and as you say, the 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 Premier League is is just a couple of weeks away now, and and um, I think there are still a lot of clubs with a lot of business to do. One of the key things for Manchester United to do has been to sign a central midfielder, they want a combative midfielder to to add intensity uh, to their game um, and he's sort of sweeping changes that Eric Ten Hag has, has asked for um, during that period of discussion with Ineos uh, about whether he would stay and if he did stay, um, what needed to change. We've talked on this podcast several times about the Manchester United wanting to sign Manuel Ugarte from Paris Saint-Germain um, first choice for that position um, there has been movement at the Paris end uh, this week, uh, also a, a deal we've discussed extensively on on the Transfers podcast that of Jean Neves moving from Benfica to Paris Saint-Germain um, as we record he's currently in an airplane um, on his way to Paris to complete that deal, assuming he passes his medical, uh, the 19-year-old um, Portugal midfielder. Uh, the deal is at the price level we discussed on, on the podcast previously, which is 60 million euros guaranteed with 10 million euros of performance-related variables. But uh, PSG have also included former Benfica player Renato Sanchez in that deal at zero cost to the Lisbon club so he'll move there on loan for the year with Paris Saint-Germain covering his uh, salary in full. Now I think that's been read by some people as Paris Saint-Germain have their central midfielder therefore the Agarty deal to Manchester United should go through. That is from, from the people I'm speaking to in both ends of the deal that is not necessarily the case. Um, 
I'm told that Manchester United's offer for the player has been 50 million euros, which is 10 million less than what PSG paid Sporting for Ugarte last summer. And, and consistently PSG have said to me that they will not sell the player at a discount. Um, he's valued by uh, the, the lead sports advisor there, Luis Campos, um, who believes that he has a, a future at Paris Saint-Germain. Uh, Luis Enrique isn't so convinced uh, and moved him out of the team in the second half of the season. But uh, the PSG stance has been consistently, if you don't uh, give us the money we paid for sporting last summer, we will, we will not sell to you. Um, on the player's side, they're confident that he is Manchester United's first choice and they're confident that a resolution will be arrived at. But talking to, to all the people involved in this deal, it, it is not as clear cut as, as some people um are expecting. So Ugarte there and, and an option for United, but it's going to be an expensive option. What's interesting is that they have begun to look at alternatives for that position. Um, number of names have been mentioned to me. Uh, Martin Zupamendi, Real Sociedad, who I think will be very difficult to extract from Sociedad. They um, are notoriously um, complicated club to take uh, players from. Uh, he has a high release clause and um, if they are going to move a player out this summer from that midfield area, it's likely to be Mikel Marino, who's nearing the end of his contract and who's one of a, a number of midfielders that Arteta, Mikel Arteta and Arsenal's identified as, as uh, players who can strengthen their midfield alongside um, Zubi Mendy and as we mentioned on last week's podcast, Fabian Ruiz at PSG will probably be the most expensive of the three. Um, the, another player United are looking at is PSV's Joey Vermeen, um, Netherlands midfielder who, who impressed in the European Championship. And I think there have been some discussions with Adrian Rabiot, who's, who's a player who's been linked with United on many occasions in the past. Um, he is a free agent at present, having finished his contract with Juventus but um, and a very expensive free agent has always been notorious for um, negotiating, or his, his, his mother is actually his agent, negotiating high um, salaries and signing on fees. So um, don't be deceived by uh, the free transfer aspect of that move. Uh, another uh, individual who I don't think has been mentioned at all um, in other reports as a candidate for Manchester United, but who I'm told they are discussing um, as an option, should the Agarty deal not go, go through, is Norway international Sander Berg. Um, he's 26 years of age. He will uh, almost certainly leave Burnley this summer, having only joined them last year um, when they were promoted to the Premier League. He does not want to play in the Championship again, having first come to the Premier League in January 2020, joined Sheffield United. It's an interesting option, uh, I think a different style to Agarty, certainly a taller player, um, probably a more elegant player in the midfield, but uh, very good at retaining possession, distributing possession, obviously has the Premier League experience, 66 games in the, the top tier, three goals, four assists, and would definitely be cheaper than Ugarte. Um, Burnley need to sell players uh, to balance their books and they're obviously targeting the sale of players like Berg who um, are unhappy at having to go down to the championship. There are other clubs interested in Berg I'm told including a couple of Champions League um, qualifiers one in Spain and one in Italy so um, I think that is a he's an individual to pay attention to I think a surprise um, option for United, but one that they might go for if they cannot get a re resolution with PSG on the fee and who would be a cheaper option and allow them to um, allocate some money to other areas of the team with a centre-back, another centre-back required, a right-back also um, on their target list for the summer. Yeah, it's definitely a, an interesting one. And like you said, he does have Premier League experience. He obviously spent a couple of years after the Premier League back in the Championship, so he you can see why he's determined to remain in the Premier League after getting relegated with, with Burnley. He goes about his business. He's a, a tidy player and you can see why Manchester United are looking at him given 
kind of the relative cost between the other players you mentioned. Rabiot, like you said, he's a free transfer, but as we know, Mama Rabiot is a <laughs> a, a tough negotiator. You know, she 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 knows how to get her her boy and her family what what, what she wants, and and more power to her. I imagine she'll hold out for the right money and the right move this summer. But yeah, Manchester United they've long needed a midfielder, but I think some United fans might wonder why Scott McTominay might 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 not be that midfielder. But it looks like he's going to be sold this summer, is he? Yeah, I was just before we talk about Scott McTominay and since you mentioned Mama Rabio, I, I heard the rumour that you use your parents to negotiate not your transfer fees but your salary conditions with footballtransfers.com. Is that is that correct, Ronan? Um, I think you will have to speak to my agent, which is my, <laughs> my own mother, about that because I'm not at liberty to go into that de- de- those details herself and football transfers have signed a non-disclosure agreement over <laughs> all deals and all all appearance fees, all like likeness fees so if you want to get me on the, the cover of FC 25 or FC 26 they'll have to pay a big sum so yeah we'll see how that goes I, ho- I hope she's on a good percentage of those um, those large 99, fortunes 99.9% nine, <laughs> <laughs> well if you need a new agent I'm available anytime yeah yeah, I'm, not, I'm sure. I'm sure she'd be happy to get less work. So she's re- she's retired now, so I I think I think she'd be happy to uh, put her feet up for. And I just count all the money she's earned from my super seller career. So today, <laughs> Scott McTominay, you you're asking about. Yeah, that's the that's the the midfielder who the Manchester United most likely to move out to create space for. Ugarte if, if they get their, their first choice or another midfielder and to generate some income um, because he is he's understandably well regarded by other Premier League clubs because he's consistent been a consistent performer in the Premier League um, able to play multiple positions, scores a lot of goals um, Fulham have been most active in Scott McTominay's uh, pursuit uh as I understand it, they've made two offers for the player so far. The first of for £17 million and the second for £20 million and are expected to make a, a further offer. They are well off what Manchester United have been asking for McTominay with a, a price of £40 million uh, mentioned to me, which I'll be surprised if they get in this current marketplace. Again, something we'll discuss later in the podcast. Um I think one to note here is Tottenham Hotspur are also strongly interested in McTominay and I think ultimately should be able to outbid Fulham um, for the player as well as um, having higher status and and the ability to offer um, European football to McTominay. Um, But yeah, I I think in all likelihood we will see McTominay move um, to another Premier League club before the end of this window. Our Turkish listeners will be disappointed to hear that because I, I seen that he was obviously linked with some tur- moves to Turkey, but let's see a lot of these players players that, that have played in in English football in the Premier League like staying in, in the Premier League and like playing in, in England and earning the money that's to, to get there in England. But Tottenham does sound like a good fit for McTominay. You can see him drive there and like we've said on previous episodes Maybe it's there where he can find his ideal position and play in his ideal position. And while might might suit him perfectly, he could be he could be the ideal midfielder for Tottenham. Yeah, I think McTominay will benefit from being a purchase rather than a player who's come through the academy and always had to fight for his position in the team. If he's coming in, it'll be and on a substantial V, it'll become with an in, an intent of him being a first team player and a coach. Um, who believes in him? So I, I think uh, that that must be a big attraction to McTominay and a good opportunity f- for him to develop into, a, you know, a guaranteed starter at Premier League club. It's interesting you mentioned Turkey because um, uh, Sander Berg was actually uh, linked with Fenerbahce this week. Um, uh, uh, some suggestion that Burnley were ready to sell him for twenty million pounds, which I. Th- I understand is way below what they're, they're looking for the player. Um, but I'm told that Fenerbahce don't have the budget uh, to get into position where they could uh, realistically bid for him at 
it, in, in my time um, monitoring the transfer market, I think Turkey is one of the places where you get some of the most random stories uh, coming out. And I, I think part of that is the, the, the politics involved in Turkish football. And there is a, there's a real uh, game played by the big clubs in particular there of um, pushing stories out to the supporters that they are pursuing players um, in order to to keep them calm. And uh, anyone who's who's watched football in Turkey knows that keeping Turkish supporters calm isn't the easiest of tasks. Yeah, yeah, a very a very passionate football loving country. An amazing, amazing country yeah. to watch football. Highly recommended to anyone who hasn't done it. Go and see a game at Galatasaray, Fenerbahce, Besiktas. It, it is, uh, it's an atmosphere that's different from anything else I've experienced anywhere in the world. Uh, you clearly, I said it earlier, I was going to talk about League of Ireland, but you clearly haven't been to, to Finn Harps on, on a Friday night, uh, the away game on the windy coast of Donegal. The wind's coming in, yeah. yeah ba Bally Buffet is a great place to visit on. I haven't, for you're right, I haven't been to Finn Harps <laughs> on a Friday night, but I have been to Peterhead to watch um, watch them play Race Rovers in a, a Scottish Cup tie, I think, and on a on a very, very wet, uh, probably a Wednesday night, and I, I suspect it's probably not too different from yeah. from Finn Harps. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's a level up from they can't do it on a cold Tuesday night in, in Stoke, playing Peterhead or in, <laughs> in Bally Buffet, I think is the next level up. Could Messi do it? But. Could he do it? Probably not. Probably not. That's why he went. That's why he went to the, the sunny climes of Florida instead. <laughs> so to get back on track, because I'm very good at getting off track. Uh, yeah, obviously you mentioned earlier that my United have had injuries already, and Ten Hag has been talking about the importance of squad depth. You're talking about them possibly selling Scott McCominay, obviously, and then on top of the Lenny Oro and Rasmus Hoyland injuries we saw Marcus Rashford limp off in in their friendly in in America the, the scoop dragon cup I think they they were handed a trophy for after so Ten Hag has started the season off he said he's there to win trophies and he's won another one so yeah I think it could be it could be a difficult one if Man United keep getting these injuries are piling up yeah you've got um Lenny Euro obviously the most expensive signing uh, they've made so far um, initial 62 million euros injured in the first half of his first game for the club in, in the pre-season loss to Arsenal um, and United have announced that they expect him to be out for three months, they're not completely sure of the extent of the injury um, it is a fracture of uh, metatarsal um, a bone that I guess Rings horror for, for most Manchester United supporters. Hoyland less serious in the sense that they expect that to be a six-week injury with a hamstring uh, strain. Uh, Marcus Rashford's was a contact injury um, in last night's uh, win over Real Betis. And I think Anthony also limped out of that match, although there's a bit of debate as to whether um, he limped out feigning injury after a poor performance or whether he was actually injured in that game but look the, the summary of it is that they are picking up um, at least some uh, muscular injuries in pre-season which is a, a very poor sign for a club who as you say um, Eric Ten Hag in his first press conference of this pre-season he emphasised the phrase survival of the fittest. I think he used it three or four times um, in answers to questions and, and referred back to it and, and uh, kind of almost pushed the journalist to ask him more questions about that subject. And uh, he, was, he was talking about it in two main ways. One was this emphasis on squad depth um, in the context of having signed two players that he was really pleased with in Lenny Yoro and Joshua Zerxe, um, but emphasising that he felt they needed more players. He, he, he said that w when we have everyone fit, we're capable of beating anyone. But as you saw last season, we didn't have enough um, depth in the squad. Um, and we have to have that. We have to have quality. Um, we have to catch up and, and, and then said even more because this will, season will be a survival of the fittest. And he's talking about how 
football in general is more demanding and that players have to be uh, working on the edge all the time. But noting that this coming season, they're faced with playing at least two additional games in Europe. All, all the teams that have qualified for European competition are faced with at least two additional games because we've got this crazy uh, Swiss model Champions League, uh, Europa League and Conference League coming in in which there'll be four additional teams in the, the group stages, which means two more group matches and then teams play a playoff stage which adds another potential two games over the already high demands of European competition um, he also emphasised player preparation um, saying that there was a responsibility on the players to to work the correct way um, say the, the exact quote the players they have to work in the right way because the standards are so high and if you have to fu fulfill them, it's only possible when you fulfill the highest standards. It's not only on game day, it's on every day. And I think if you, you look back at what happened in very high profile incidents with Marcus Rashford, for example, disappearing um, to party in, uh, in a part of the world not too far away from you, Ronan. Um, I don't know if you were involved in that. Um, no, you... I was at Barry Buffet watching Finn Harps. <laughs> Uh, probably Ten Hag would have been happier if uh, yeah. Marcus Rashford had been watching Finn Harp instead. Yeah. Um, so, he, so that emphasis on the players having to uh, look after their body and rest properly um, in order to be in the right position on match day uh, is something he's talking about. He, he has said that from a physical perspective... He's pleased they've added a new, added a new uh, head of sports medicine who was actually in place for the majority of last season in Gary O'Driscoll, uh, stolen or taken from Arsenal, and Jordan Reese, head physio, also taken from Arsenal for this coming season. Um, but said that he expects injuries, and they had over 60 injuries last season, to happen again, um, citing... Uh, multiple reasons, the amount of games, the fixture list, load on the players, the pressure on the players being so high. And it, his solution, the one he keeps emphasising, is squad depth. Um, I think there's a legitimate question about whether Eric Ten Hag has been using the right training methods for Manchester United when you have that many injuries over um, the the past season. Um, and you can go back to some Ten Hag quotes in, in September last year where he, he talked about having a, a squad uh, sufficient to cope with injuries, which was obviously proved to be incorrect. Um, when you change a number of coaches in the summer, bringing Ruud van Nistelrooy, Rennie Hacke in as his main assistants, um, you would expect that in pre-season they wouldn't be suffering injuries so quickly. I'm certainly not suffering muscular injuries in pre-season so quickly. And I think the idea that you just get round this by signing more and more players is a problematic one. I, I think if you talk to top coaches, they will tell you that part of avoiding injuries is the way in which you train the players. Um, and you have to be very careful about how you load them uh, in terms of work in pre-season and during the season and you have to be very careful in assessing um, the the state of their body and the state of their mind during a season. Um, go back in, in the series of the Transfers podcast, one of the, the interviews we did was with Rui Faria, um, ironically also a, a, a Manchester United coach in the past, assistant to Josie Mourinho. And he talks about the methods he uses and has used very successfully throughout his career um, to avoid injury while having players at the highest competitive level, which has been demonstrated in, in the success. He's had over 20 trophies, two Champions League, multiple Premier League, etc. And interestingly, he, on his Insta Instagram account this week, he talked about the survival of the fittest not long after Ten Hag had, had mentioned the phrase um, and I think it's worth, worth Manchester United supporters having a look at. He says, the survival of the fittest or the survival of those who work better 
Is increasing the size of your squad the secret to Premier League success? Does a team achieve stability of performance by building a 30-man squad? When a club suffers injury after injury, the solution is not squad depth, it is improving the quality of work delivered to the players. And, and I think Rui makes an interesting point there. Yes, you can add lots more players to the squad, which is obviously going to cost a lot of money. Um, and money is a hugely important factor in the Premier League at present um, with the profit and sustainability rules. But can you maintain stability of performance just by building a bigger squad? Because if you have more players and you have to rotate, rotate more, um, then obviously the understanding between the players is going to be compromised. So I don't think this this it's a straightforward answer to just say, we've got more games, uh, there's more intense demands in the players, we need to bring more players in and that that will solve the problems. I think there is, as Faria is suggesting, there's an alternative here, which is to be uh, more efficient uh, and more intelligent in your training ground work. He he talks about focusing on recovery being as important as getting the players up to a competitive level of fitness in order to keep your best players on the pitch um, as often as possible. And you know, just as a final comment on this, uh, when Ten Hag was working at Ajax, uh, he worked with a, a fitness coach, Alessandro Schoenmacher, who I believe he tried to bring to Manchester United in his first uh, season at the club and was unable to, to convince um, Ajax to release him at a, a, a reasonable price. And I think it's been a big surprise to me that given what Ten Hag has suffered through, and, and he's talked about it, one phrase he used was swimming with your hands tied behind your back uh, as a description of what it's like to, to deal with so many players. I, I've been surprised that he hasn't tried to bring Schoenmacher to Manchester United this summer when they've made so many changes to the coaching staff because that obviously was a, a tried and, and trusted combination at Ajax and it appears to have been something, the loss of that fitness coach to Ten Hag which has is, which is made it problematic for him in English football. Yeah, maybe that that's the big signing Manchester United need rather than some of the other names that, that are being linked. Maybe that's what Ten Hag needs to stay afloat given his uh, swimming method for there. But he needs to stay afloat and, and succeed at uh, Manchester United. So, yeah, the, the amount of injuries that are coming er, even before the season starts is a worrying concern given the problems that Manchester United had last season and that many of the problems could be kind of blamed on the fact that key players were injured or he couldn't play his best 11 and that's what Manchester United fans were saying after the FA Cup final that, see this is what he can do when he has the players best players available to him he can he can be a trophy winner but those players weren't available and didn't want their their big marquee signing looks to be out for a long time and that they might they might struggle then at the, the back without him and they have big problems, and these big problems don't seem to be going away for Manchester United at the moment. I think I think he's made something of a rod for his own back by emphasising injuries and lack of availability of players as the reason why they didn't perform in the Premier League as he hoped and expected them to do last season. Um, because given that overhaul of the coaching staff, which he's been allowed to lead. Um, and given that he's emphasised that that was a problem, the expectation is you need to solve that this summer. It's early days. It's only pre-season. This might be uh, coincidental. They might have uh, switched to a training system which keeps the majority of the squad fit for the rest of the season and everything will be fine. But if he does suffer a lot of injuries again this season, I don't think uh, Dave Brailsford and Jim Ratcliffe will... Um, take that in a, in a generous fashion. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think the Euro injury, obviously, maybe is a different thing because it's during a match or whatever and if he's just after arriving at the club and reports have yep. come out and our own Jack Talbot at Football Transfer said that PSG were kind of put off signing him because of concerns over the way he was developing as a young player and that he could be more liable to 
to get the injuries and the same report then or in Le Keep and in French media then on on Wednesday evening. So I think that might be a separate case to perhaps the the ongoing injury issues. But like you said, if we if we do see these injury issues crop up again and again, the blame has to fall at Ten Hag's door because he is the one that's training them and putting them on the, the training ground and putting them through these intense sessions to make them the team into who he wants to be. But if he is pushing them too hard then and they're not getting the results on the pitch, then ultimately he's the one responsible. I think I think with Euro there's a question about whether the, the pitch in Los Angeles, which was uh, a pitch uh, that is not normally used for football, I think it's a $5.5 billion stadium in Los Angeles, spectacular place, but um, clearly not perfect for football. There's been a question of whether the, the, the pitch was uh, played a role in that metatarsal fracture, and that's certainly a possibility. Um, my guidance from PSG and why they didn't uh, follow up on their interest in Euro was simply that the price was too high. The salary demands uh, were way uh, above what they thought were reasonable um, for uh, an 18-year-old who was still on his first uh, professional contract at Lille. And I, and I believe the um, the commission on the transfer fee was also high. As we discussed previously on, on that deal, Manchester United clearly bet big on um, knocking everyone else out of the marketplace in terms of a high transfer fee, um, substantial commission and, and a very high salary for a young player. Um, probably they've just been unlucky with, with that injury. Um, it's the injuries that they can control that they need to control. We haven't seen too many of those big money moves so far this season. What, only two weeks until the, the Premier League kicks off and it is Manchester United in action and hosting Fulham with the Premier League kicking off. And there's not been huge kind of transfers like a Eleni or other. He's kind of one of the exceptions. And why has that been, do you think? Yeah, I, I, I was looking through it this week to get, get a sense of where we were. The most expensive deal so far um, is Michael Olise's uh, release clause move from Crystal Palace to Bayern Munich, which exceeds the the 62 million um, initial fee that United paid for Euro. Um, Euro is the second highest. Uh, João Neves, assuming he passes his medical today, will be the third, um, 60 million plus 10 million. Then you have Ali Etihad, making a kind of statement purchase of a 25-year-old player rather than a, an older, uh, more established name in Moussa Diaby. Um, bought from Aston Villa for £50 million. Amadou Anana, Everton to Aston Villa, also £50 million. Then you have Douglas Louise uh, to Aston Villa to Juventus, and that, that one's slightly deceptive in that there was a financial fair play swap deal component with with uh, younger players coming in the other direction to help both sides balance their books. And then Jean Paligna, uh, Fulham to Bayern. Those seven deals are the only ones um, for over 50 million euros so far this summer. And and as you say, we're into the last month now of the window. And Bayern Munich, the reason that they've made the, the deals is because they didn't win the league after winning it for 11 years in a row. So you, they, those ones are exceptions rather than the rule for a yeah. team like that. Bayern Munich under pressure, wanting to make a splash. Compare that with last summer. And, and okay, we're talking about the entire window here rather than with a, with a month left. There were 24 deals of, of, of 50 million euros or more. And 10 of those were more than 70 million euros or more, which is the, the maximum that uh, that uh, Lille and Benfica can take from the Euro and Neves deals. So you, so you see that there, there's a lot of transfers of substantially bigger um, transfer fee value than we're, we've seen this summer. And the, the highest ones, Declan Rice, Moise Caicedo and Jude Bellingham, all of the fees significantly in, in excess of 100 million euros each. Um, 
I think another you can take another example, which is to look at players who I think would have gone for a lot more money last summer than they've gone for this summer. So you've got Crescencio Somerville, um, who's just uh, West Ham United have just agreed a deal with Leeds United um, for initial transfer fee of twenty four point five million pounds, and this is a a twenty two year old. Um, who scored 19 goals, nine assists, um, playing off the wing in 41 championship starts last season. Um, in the Premier League the year before, in a relegated poor side, he made 12 starts, scored four and two. I know he was um, strongly admired by Liverpool. They were interested in taking him. And I think you would not have seen Somerville moving uh, contract conditions being the same, two years left in his contract, 22 years of age, the, the performances. Last summer, for as small a fee as £24.5 million, I think you'd probably the difference would have been that Liverpool, instead of being cautious about their deals, which they have been throughout this summer, would have um, said, OK, we can compete for that one. And, and that would, if you have just one more club with finances available and an interest in a player competing then usually um, as long as the player's interested in going to both of the clubs that sends the the transfer fees up and it's rarely happening this summer and there aren't that many clubs with the wherewithal to buy players we talked about the French league and the problem they're having with television uh, deals and and a, a significant cut in their new deals so there's Essentially, no one in France uh, beyond Paris Saint-Germain and Marseille, who've done a few deals at, at a lower level, who have money to spend. Um, Spanish football is essentially without a club who are going to spend significant money. Real Madrid could do it, but are playing a very canny game and using the same sort of strategies they've used in the past. Yoro being the the key example here, he was the player they identified as they wanted at centre back, and they were prepared to wait for a year's time uh, to run his contract down and take him for free, in the expectation that Leo would have to uh, negotiate at a lower level, which which didn't work out for them. But they haven't spent. Barcelona desperately want to spend and uh, and uh, spend a huge amount of time briefing the Spanish press that they're going to go for. Um, a, a number of, of uh, exciting names such as Nico Williams, but they haven't been able to find the money to do that because their um, financial situation is, is really strained. They wanted to sell Ronald Araujo. He got injured in the Copa America. That's been taken away from him. They're currently trying to find a Premier League buyer for Rafinha, who I think Julio Gomez Filho on one of the earlier transfers podcasts suggested he was probably their best forward last season. Um, but they, they want to move him out because they see him as a sellable asset. Uh, he doesn't want to go and they have a, a, a significant handicap in that they have him on an annual salary of 13 million euros gross. So not only do they have to find a club who'll give them a substantial transfer fee in the Premier League because they're basically outside Saudi Arabia, the only place with, with money to spend, they also have to find a club who can take on the salaries and I think that that is a limiting factor here is that a lot of players are already on very high salaries. Then you add in the, the PSR in the Premier League case and financial fair play rules. We've seen Nottingham Forest, we've seen Everton uh, suffer points punishments, uh, in Everton's case two of them. Every Premier League is super conscious that they have to get their budgets in order to pass PSR because they they know and they feel that there's a real risk they'll get hit with a points penalty of their own, which is why we've seen these um, PSR swap deals that um, Newcastle have done with Nottingham Forest, that Aston Villa uh, have done with Chelsea, even though we're past that, that first um, PSR deadline of, of uh, 30th of June, um, Chelsea are still trying to propose PSR swap deals to clubs um, offering uh, over the odds transfer fees um, for players that they want to buy 
on the condition that the club selling take one of their unwanted players again for what most people would consider to be over the odd uh, over the odd f- fees for the players. So it's an it's an issue because I, there are so few clubs with cash to spend. Last summer we were saved by the Saudi Pro League um, putting basically a billion dollars of money into transfer fees into various European leagues by buying um, mostly established players, which then trickled through the system. Uh, this summer, that's not really happening. I mentioned the, the Jabi deal, that's the highest uh, purchase by a Saudi Pro League club. Good example of what they're actually doing versus what they might be doing is Al Itihad. Um, last week's podcast, we talked about them uh, considering taking Mallorca goalkeeper Predrag Rajkovic um, for a fee of 10 million euros. They've now agreed that deal. And that's instead of uh, signing either Ederson from Manchester City or Jan Oblak from Atletico. Um, my guidance is that Etihad offered 30 million euros for Ederson. Manchester City said, no, we want 50 million euros, uh, knowing that the player was keen to leave and pushing for the deal. And Etihad said, no, we're not going to pay that much for a goalkeeper. Um, Atletico took the 30 million offer for All Black, who was interested in going. And then um, my guidance uh, was that uh, when he consulted his, his uh, tennis playing girlfriend, Olga Danilovic, about um, the idea of moving together to Jeddah, the deal fell through. Um, so you not only not got the Saudi Pro League moving for those big name players, they're ratcheting back their spending on other players. And okay, it might change, and it's been suggested to me that the strategy of the Saudi clubs could be to wait till the European uh, transfer window is closed because their own window remains open until October and then pick off players from the financially stretched European clubs uh, at the end of the window. So go to the clubs that they know have got FFP problems and say, right, we'll give you X tens of millions for, for one of your players because we know you've got to do a deal. But again, that's not going to inflate the European market and uh, it's going to result in the overall transfer fees remaining uh, down for this window. Which is good if you are a shrewd club that doesn't spend big money for 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 the middling teams. It's probably the the, the teams in the middle of the pack, I should say, rather than middling teams, because they're all fantastic teams, as you well know. But the teams that maybe are mid-table teams, it probably suits them better that there isn't these crazy money fees between the bigger clubs that they can actually afford to get a summer veil for for 24 million or 22 million rather than what he would have cost last summer which was probably twice that much so yeah it's a, it's a different a different kind of transfer window but one where bargains and, and good value can still be found and, and probably will be found it's just it's just the clubs have to kind of fight for that and it'll be make it kind of more intriguing as we get to the, the close of the window, what the transfer will be, we won't be seeing these kind of 100 million signings anymore, which might necessarily be a bad thing. So a couple of weeks ago, we were having a chat about Newcastle United, their new direction. Amanda Staveley has gone. She was obviously a key figure in Newcastle's bounce back to, to being a top team in, in England and in Europe again. And she gave a pretty interesting interview and she kind of revealed her some of her plans or hinted at the her plans for the future and I think you have more details yeah um there was an interesting interview with the athletic in that uh, I think you have to read between the lines in what she said um as we detailed on the podcast the decision for her and her husband Merdad Kadusi to leave Newcastle United was one that Kate was forced upon them was taken um by a uh, public investment fund, uh, the, the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, um, for reasons we, we detailed in that podcast. And at no point does Amanda Staveley actually state that she was moved out, but 
you can see in many of our comments, for example, the, the headline one, I'm devastated, it's such a wonderful club, so it feels very bittersweet, it's become part of my DNA, something you love so much and don't want to let go, it's very painful. Um, she, she talks about um, having to leave because she wasn't going to have as, as strong an executive role and uh, she's someone who needs to work and she didn't want to be a passenger at the club and didn't want to get in the way of, of the people who'd be taking the decisions. But essentially, there's confirmation there, although Stavely doesn't see it directly herself, that she didn't want to leave. She's also questioned about um, a report that, that Bloomberg issued not long after her exit from Newcastle United that herself and her husband, Merdad Gudusi, had raised £500 million pounds, um, for their PCP Capital Partners firm uh, in a new fund in order to buy another football club which uh, they would potentially become the managing partners in. Um, two clubs were mentioned in that report, Tottenham Hotspur and, and Monaco. Um, her comment in, in the interview when asked about that was that she couldn't give too many of the details, but she said, Merdad and I are keen to be hands-on. We're hardworking people. I love to be very busy and to engage, and I love football. Very sadly, we have to move on to other projects, and that might involve us taking a stake in another club or buying another club. But And that's difficult, but it's possible. Um, so I've been asking around this, and, and the guidance I have is, indeed, the idea that Stavely and her husband have is to raise money in a fund um, in order to purchase probably what will be a Premier League club. Also, I'm told the primary target is Tottenham Hotspur. They see that as the, the most attractive of the assets um, for external investors in the Premier League at present, and I think they're, they're correct about that. Um, I'm told that they're still in the process of raising funds um, they're hopeful of securing that money um, in the coming months, but it's not actually in, in place yet. And then as to the mechanics of, of a purchase of Tottenham Hotspur, it's obvious that 500 million will not be enough to, to get hold of Tottenham Hotspur. Um, figures that are mentioned at present in, in the press are 3.5 to 3.75 billion as a valuation that Tottenham are looking for the club. What I can tell you is that uh, in early 2022, um, a Los Angeles-based um, special acquisition company, a SPAC, tried to buy a minority stake in Tottenham um, at a whole club valuation of £3 billion. Pounds. So they, they came and met Daniel Levy and said, we value the club at £3 billion. Um, we'd like to take a, a percentage of that. I think they'd raised two hundred and fifty million dollars um, on the uh, on the U.S. stock market in order to set up the company with the idea of buying into football. And Levy was not at all interested in that. Um, guidance I had from Tottenham at the time was that they wouldn't uh, consider selling a minority stake to a public listed company, which this LEMF Global Ventures was partly because of the reporting issues involved um, and the guidance was that they didn't have an issue with the valuation so they liked the valuation of $3 billion. but this was before Clear Lake and co-investors um, paid $2.5 billion for Chelsea obviously it was long before Ratcliffe and Ineos um, bought just over a quarter of Manchester United at a valuation of $6 billion um, and then you contrast what Tottenham have compared to Manchester United and Chelsea and one of the biggest things they have is the £1 billion uh, plus stadium is already built and in place and in London and all the, the, uh, the planning issues and the financing issues solved. They also have a state-of-the-art training ground. Um, Chelsea have the training ground um, but they still have this, the stadium to, to build um, and we see... Ratcliffe and co kind of briefing about uh, a hundred thousand seater stadium to be built um, to replace Old Trafford on the on an adjoining site and 
floating a cost of, of two billion um, of additional investment um, to uh, to make that happen. So I think if you if you believe the valuations of European football clubs are realistic, and as long as there's one person who's prepared to pay another valuation at the level of Chelsea or Manchester United, then I guess they are. Then Tottenham are are I think at three billion um, probably undervalued. Uh, because they have the stadium in place, they have very good financial books, um, very low um, wage to to revenue ratio. Ratio. They have the training ground in place. It's kind of a ready-made blank canvas. Uh, they haven't even sold the naming rights yet. Um, to have one of the top clubs in the Premier League based in London uh, as a purchase, whether Staveley will be able to get herself in a position that her investment fund can convince Daniel Levy that she's bringing the right investors on board because she will have to bring another, at least one other investor, possibly another sovereign wealth fund. And to be fair to Amanda Stavenley, her, her record is unprecedented in that regard and that she was the, the person who did the, the deal, put the deal in place for Abu Dhabi to buy Manchester City. And obviously the person who put the deal in place after about five years of work for Saudi Arabia to buy Newcastle United. Um, she has two incredible successes. She had multiple goes at buying Liverpool. In one incident, the money was going to come from Dubai for that. So you can see she has the connections in the Middle East. And, and uh, it wouldn't surprise me if she tried to bring another Middle East investor in to do this. Um, but a fun process of negotiating with Daniel Levy. Um, she obviously knows him well from Premier League interactions, but uh, I think most people who've, who've tried to negotiate anything with Daniel Levy will will tell you it is not the most uh, pleasant of experiences, and don't uh, don't guarantee that anything is going to happen until if all the documents are signed and the and the long um, bartering process is has, has gone through its painful stages. Yeah, so I think, like you said, she is something that she has. Her desire on it, something that will probably happen, whether it's Tottenham or a different club. I think we'll see Amanda Stavely busy again in the in the football club transfer window, perhaps with the with the with the valuations of this team, these clubs. We need an estimated transfer value for for the club itself, and not just the players mm-hmm. that play at the club. The other one we should mention here, because we're talking about club purchases, is um, and and it probably goes into this picture of of players taking. A bigger and bigger chunk of uh, football's revenue through their salaries is that Kylian Mbappe has just bought 80% of um, Ligue 2 Cannes um, through one of his companies um, for a reported 20 million euros, um, which is, for example, a fraction of his signing on fee at Real Madrid um, and emphasises, I think, the the... The, that balance of power between money going to players where a guy at 25 years of age can go and, and buy a football club in its entirety um, almost with, uh, with with spare change from his perspective um, while uh, the majority of uh, League 2 clubs are, are struggling to get the, the revenue to, to balance their books through the season Um Guidance on that is that that deal was something that Mbappe's family had been working on for for quite a period of time, and it's something that is very much a family investment. As his father Wilfred is a coach, um, his mother Faiza is obviously deeply involved in football as as an agent. She probably swaps notes with your mum, Ronan, and uh, and uh, Mama Rabio, and uh, the plan is to appoint. Mbappe's head of image rights um, to be president of the club going forward. Yeah, my my mother, uh, I don't think she'd be handing me out twenty million euro to, to buy a football club in, in Normandy in France. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting move, and I suppose it's a different angle than than Lucas P- Podolski's kebab shops or whatever. But we've seen we we've seen football footballers. Who own clubs be successful? And I mentioned Messi at Finn Herbst, Messi at Miami, and David Beckham has shown that this is a an avenue where the footballers can go in. And I imagine it's it's a long term project for Kylian Mbappe too, especially with the family involvement. So it will be interesting to see what happens with that. And 
if you're ever in the re in the region in, in Con, I would recommend visiting the the Memorial Museum, the World War Two Memorial Museum in, in the town there. It's it's fantastic. So if you're in that part of Normandy, and that that's somewhere you can stop off when you're visiting Mbappe's football club, who have one of the most incredible badges in world football. If you haven't seen it, pause the podcast for a minute, or while you're scrolling on your phone, not when you're driving. If you're driving now, pull in, please. <laughs> but have a have a look at their badge because it's a, a pretty <laughs> incredible. It's it's one that's worth worth looking at. So I can I can see what drew them to to this club. I, if if my mother does decide to open the purse strings and give me some of the twenty million that she owes me, I will maybe invest in the second division side. And it's too. Back on on transfers, people have been been listening to us talk about Manchester, but Man United for a while and, and Newcastle and. Even even some clubs in France, but Arsenal fans are probably wondering what's what's going to happen with them. Obviously, you spoke about their desire for a midfielder earlier, but they're still looking for a striker. And the man who you heavily put into the show notes, how to pronounce his name, he uh, is one that's linked to Sporting Sporting CP striker, the the uh, Sporting club, the Portugal striker. Your Koresh, is that am I got that right? Yeah, I think I think so. Victor Jorkeres is is I think the the pronunciation. The Swedish striker um, at Sporting. Um, we talked about him with Sergio Crutinus on on one of our earlier podcasts. The interesting movement on that this week is that Sporting announced that they had um, reduced Coventry's uh, prof uh, sell on clause. Um, on the profit from Jurkarish's next sale from 15% to 10% after paying an additional 2 million euros in performance related bonuses and taking up a 1 million option, 1 million euro option to reduce the sell on clause. Um, Steve Kay actually uh, did a report for footballtransfers.com this week um, saying that Jurkarish remains Arsenal's first choice to reinforce at centre forward but that they will pay no more than 60 million euros um, for the player. Um, Sergio was telling us about how he had had meniscus surgery after the cup final and was expected to be uh, fit again for the start of the season, which he has now uh, returned for pre-season. Um, but he had some doubts about the longevity of his career and some comments Ruben Amarim had made about um, how hard Jurkic pushed himself, and I think saying at one point that he didn't expect him to play uh, into his thirties off the, the back of that. So, okay, look, this is it's a very interesting move if Arsenal decide to go for it because he's a player who spent multiple seasons in English football. Um, initially signed by Brighton as a twenty-year-old, then loaned to Swansea City and Coventry before being sold to Coventry, scored well in his last two seasons in the championship um, for Coventry and then exceptionally uh, for Sporting 34 and 42 League and European games last season also um, uh, being credited with 11 assists. Sergio's take on Jurkic was that he's a perfect fit for Portuguese football because of his physicality and he can almost blow defenders away, take two guys on and knock them both over before scoring. He's a little bit sceptical about whether that translates in into English football um, and into the Premier League, whether that physical advantage is nullified or at least reduced when you put him up against Premier League defences. It'd be fascinating to see if, if they go for it. It wouldn't surprise me if, if Sporting uh, accept a, a reduction on the €100 million Euros release clause because they like pretty much every um, Portuguese club are dependent on sales as we've already discussed in this podcast the sales aren't happening you have that Jean Neves deal I think if you go back to our earlier podcast we told you then that Benfica were saying we will not sell the player for less than 100 million they end up selling him for 60 guaranteed so there's definitely um, an urgency on the Portuguese side the question is whether Arsenal um, get to the right number on him and whether they feel he is the best option they have um, got their uh, defensive reinforcement um, Ricardo Calafiori from Bologna 
a deal done um, as uh, Mikel Arteta stacks his team with centre-backs who also operate at full-back. Um, so you've got Calafiore, Ben White, Tomiyasu Takahiro, Jurian Timber. I don't know It's don't know if it's just me, but you'd think he was trying to copy Pep Guardiola's um, Premier League and Champions League winning system in, in filling filling your defence full of centre-backs. He, 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 as long as he doesn't go the centre-back and striker route that we <laughs> saw with Gary Doherty, or Doherty as they'd say in the UK, for, for Norwich and, and Ireland, he was a man of many talents. When Ireland were struggling for for a goal, Big Gary would go on in the hope that he could head one in in the last couple of minutes. It usually didn't happen. But <laughs> I was going. I was going to say, Ronan. It usually didn't happen, but it was. It was an interesting plan B, and I think. I think, Ukraine could be a, a plan B or a, a different option, than what Arsenal have a up front at the moment because he is a very different player than Kai Havertz or Gabriel Jesus. So it will be interesting to see if he does move to Arsenal how he would fit in because the Arteta trust the process has been kind of building up so far and we kind of know what to expect and their out of possession play is obviously incredible but how how they adapt to having a totally different sort of forward than what's done before would be interesting to follow because could be could be the thing they need might be what pushes them over the line from being runners up to be, maybe being Premier League winners well, in the many ways in which they've tried to copy the the Pep Guardiola Manchester City um, playbook, I think one of the ones that they're, they're definitely advancing on is that idea of having two um, first choice players for each position, two players who can interchange um, without having imposing a handicap on the first team. They're not at the level of Manchester City yet, but. With those defensive reinforcements, for example, they're they're getting close to it in certain areas of the field, and and yeah, Arteta's talked about having to improve in every dimension, and they they clearly are trying to furnish him with what he's asking for, um, and yeah, it'll be fascinating to see whether he can push them that extra. Uh, stage onwards and, and and end Manchester City's um, almost embarrassing dominance of the Premier League. Or maybe Arteta can be the hero at the end of the season and Pep the villain. So that kind of leads us on to the final part of our, our show, the, the usual wrap-up one, the, the hero and the villain. So I think you wanted me to start this week with, with my villain of the week. So my villain, I'm going for the IOC. IOC the, the, the Olympics is on at the moment and we're all glued to it, especially in Ireland, because we're we're racking up the medals like it's nobody's business, but yeah, the uh, the IOC is my villain of the week because football at the Olympics has been disappointing. I'm not going to lie; it's it, having watched the rugby sevens and seeing what happens with them. It's not; it's kind of a smaller, more entertaining game. But football at the Olympics, it hasn't really, it hasn't really stood out. Obviously, you remember back in 2012 with. Team GB and David Beckham and all this sort of stuff, but having it kind of restricted to under 23 players, having a lot of the players kind of not be allowed leave to play for the Olympics, it being on at the same time as preseason, it kind of, it takes away from the charm of it. So I think at the moment it's sort of somewhat, what a halfway house and it's not really working. So either they move to futsal for the Olympics in the future or maybe just make it all amateurs could be the way to go, like the Olympics should be and just have Big Mick from the local pub in centre midfield. He's 52, but he can still <laughs> pick out a good pass. That's, I think that's the way football should be at the Olympics rather than th- these professionals, but only some of the professionals because in every other sport, it's kind of the best in the world. But in football, it's not, and it's kind of, it's kind of disappointing to to watch some of the matches without the best players. It's not as good. Having come from a such a great summer watching the Euros and watching Copa America, it's kind of disappointing to watch football at the Olympics for me, anyway. So the villains are they all see for me. Um, heroes of the week, I'm going to give to Manchester City. Uh, um, why you ask for accepting? being found guilty of 23 incidences of delaying the starts or restarts of a Premier League match over the last two seasons, including the match that won them last season's title against West Ham United, which they managed to delay for 
2 minutes and 46 seconds, the uh, the second half of that game. Um, they were fined a total of over £2 million with that final match costing them £200,000. Um, and why am I saying applaud the her- heroic decision? Um, because they decided not to hire the most expensive lawyers in the land and and contest the, the Premier League's right to enforce its own rules. Um Drawing the case out for five years, and I think I think we've got we've got to applaud that. That's uh, it's something we'd like to see in other in other areas with with Manchester City and and their uh, conflicts, shall we say, with governing bodies over um, over what the rule book says they should be allowed to do. Thanks very much, as always. You've been listening to the Transfers Podcast, powered by footballtransfers.com. If you liked what you heard, please follow us on your favourite podcast platform and turn on automatic downloads to get the latest episode as soon as it's released. If you really like the Transfers Podcast, please lend us just a bit more of your time by rating or reviewing the pod. Your support helps build a bigger audience and bring you more news, analysis and insight. You can also follow and message us on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube at Transfers Podcast. And you can follow us on Twitter at TransfersCast. Duncan is on Twitter and Instagram at Duncan Castles. I'm on Twitter. Swear I'm not Paul. We also have a WhatsApp channel. So search for the Transfers Podcast on WhatsApp or follow the links in the show notes. Our music and production, as always, is by Mark Caulfield, Pro Podcast Production. We'll be back next week. Stay safe, be well, and thank you for listening.